Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Hi, one and all. Troopers and young stars. Good to be with you again. Nice to be alive. Is it not? It's quite, um, it's quite wonderful. And uh, we certainly are very lucky to be living in these times. So hello one and all, and thanks for joining us. Um, thanks David for the videos and all your looking after the, the, uh, the webinar, etc. Really appreciate that. Um, I have discussed with Dave, um, I've been following the work of Kevin Annett um, over the years, a couple of years now, and um, Kevin Annett has been very proactive in getting the uh, the Indigenous people of Canada some respect and dignity and for and closure um, toward all of the um, genocide that has taken place in Canada toward the Indigenous people from the um, from the churches and in particular the Uniting Church, which he was a member of. Now, Kevin Annett, um, David will kindly um, put the link to his latest video. And he's showing there where he is having um, some successes in uh, getting these crimes recognised and um, getting the uh, culprits uh, pros prosecuted and processed. So um, the reason I'm discussing this before we get into the uh, webinar subject for this week um, is so that one and all can grab that link and share it around to as many people as possible because it really needs to be seen <clears throat> what the churches are really doing. Churches are masquerading in the name of religion and philosophy and charity and benevolence, etc., Christianity, masquerading it in the name of Christianity, um, and killing. It's a killing machine. It's a death cult. And all of corporate Christianity is involved. They're land grabbers and killers. And so um, Kevin Annett is um, doing some wonderful work, some uh, very, very powerful work, whereby he is exposing the crimes of corporate Christianity and how they've killed many, many innocent victims in through the schooling system and through hospitals and etc and through the justice system the so-called justice system um, <clears throat> um david if you, if you put the clip on i think um everyone can just grab the link uh, i don't it doesn't need to play i don't think it needs to play for too long but i'd just like to sort of flash it up for a couple of minutes, uh, perhaps at the end of the first hour and then at the end of the second hour, and then people can grab the link and then just send it off to everybody that they know. Because it's really, really urgent. We have a very, we're living in a very unique time now. And as you will see, because we're going to be talking about the dark satellite and the source of all the evil that we know of, really. Um, but we're living in a time when this dark satellite now is receding and it's going away. And its influences, its vicious animal influences are receding and are more uh, less felt as it continues to recede, you see. So uh, the idea is to help in the exposing of the institutions that have uh, dark agendas in the world. Now is the time. Carpe diem. Now is the time to seize the day and to preach from the rooftops what they're doing, immunising mankind with uh, poisons, thimerosal and mercury, fluoridating the waters, spraying chemtrails in the skies, 
poisoning us generally with education and indoctrination and mind control and brainwashing. Uh, now's the time, guys. Grab the bull by the horns. Now's the time to do your part in exposing because it's only exposure that's going to kill the beast. It's not by protesting and fighting and warring and interacting, interacting with these agencies because that's what they want. They want problem, reaction, solution. You see, they call that the Hegelian dialectic. And another philosopher, Malthus, the Malthusian um, doctrine, which incorporates survival of the fittest and uh, eugenics. We see that all these um, corporate thugs are interested in eugenics for some reason or another. Why would they be? Like Bill Gates. Since when did, did he become a, um, a doctor or a, uh, an expert on how good immunisation is for children in Africa? And he's going to give millions of dollars towards vaccinating everybody on the planet. I mean, he's already got one monopoly. You know, the control of uh, uh, cyberspace, uh, the control of uh, the internet and um, software, etc. But he's quite happy now to be involved in uh, immunising people because he believes it's, it's good for people. I don't know how much research he's done into immunisation, but um, all you need to do is look seriously for five minutes and you'll realise that something very, very shonky is going on with immunisation. Very shonky. And um, the, the amount of people that it has damaged. Anyway, so that was a little bit, um, bit of an introduction there for um, today's topic. I've picked two topics today and I'd like to spend um, some time now on uh, the subject of the dark satellite. I was going to write something and uh, post it on the um, on the websites, the Holy School. But I, unfortunately I've just been <laughs> too busy, busy so I'm going to take this opportunity to get it out and share with you um, probably some vital information uh, about the source of evil because there's a lot of confusion um, you know we hear about reptilians we hear about um, transdimensional extraterrestrial greys and whatever that uh, that are involved with NASA and the CIA and, and then we hear about uh, demons angels that fell from heaven and Christians are teaching in church that these angels are very very evil and you can actually be become demonized if you get attached to one of these demons and um, their only purpose is to serve Satan their lord and hero and savior and Satan is the enemy of uh, God who is the good one you see and they worship the good one yes in church, I'll tell you that, we worship the good God, who is an enemy of the bad guy, God, which is a fallen angel called Lucifer. Well, all of this is fancy. It's all uh, an invention um, that the Christians have concocted. Um, but um, probably the, uh, the best information that you'll get about the source of evil is from The Light of Egypt, Thomas H. Burgoyne, Volume 1. And I'm going to read some little snippets from the uh, chapter. It's only a, it's only a, uh, a short chapter. I know. Of about um, 10 pages. I know. What I'll do is I'll just drop the volume down for that video. But um, guys, that's the, that's the video. And uh, please grab, grab the, uh, the link to that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, are they using Africans as guinea pigs? Yeah, they are, Tasha. They're, um, they have been for a long time now. The Vatican has been harvesting Africans for uh, uh, people trafficking, the slave, the slave trade that happened in the 15th, 16th century. All of this, and um, they uh, have been 
medicating, killing, indoctrinating, and basically not leaving people alone for thousands of years now. And uh, I'm going to show the, the origins of this, you see. These people who are doing this on the earthly plane are actually controlled themselves. And not by Satan and the demons, as Christians will have you believe, um, but, but by what's called the dark satellite. So the dark satellite is, um, is an orb, and it's one of the chakras of the earth. And it is a magnetic animal chakra. It contains the animal spirits of the earth. Okay, so let me just read uh, the introduction to this um, this chapter, where he says that when we look about us with the physical senses, nature seems to be in continual warfare with herself. In fact, it seems utterly impossible to find anything not in deadly conflict with something else, either visible or invisible. Observing this, mankind has unconsciously, from time immemorial, formulated the idea of two great powers, viz, good and evil. Obviously, because if you see the forces of nature seemingly producing evil effects, like volcanoes and hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and tsunamis that kill millions of people. Um, there's a good concept of good and evil that develops from that, isn't there? From this idea, the grand dogma of theology, God and the devil, sprang into existence and became the chief cornerstone of every sacerdotalism which the world has witnessed. And while there is some basic truth in this idea, as in every popular conception, since mankind as a whole cannot formulate any idea that is holy and absolutely false in every detail, yet there is also much that is utterly false to it, owing to the fact that man, while existing upon the material plane, cannot grasp the divine idea of absolute truth nor realise the logical absurdity of more than one absolute. He therefore utterly fails to comprehend how that which is relative evil can be harmonised into absolute good. According, accordingly to the majority of mankind, this mighty problem of good and evil is still unsolved. And but few, very few indeed, even of the profoundly learned students of occult law in the past, arrived at a true conception of the subject. So it's a, it's a great problem. It's not a little problem. The, this, this concept of good and evil, it is a problem which perplexes, perplexes even uh, students of occult law. Uh, let alone the exoteric guys who are going to church and they're getting the real sort of um, the real bottom lower rung exoteric version of the story just to keep them in slavery even more and in fear you see because if, if you have a fear that there's an enemy out there um, you're going to be living in fear, an invisible one in particular, who's uh, able to steal your soul, even more so. So this is why the churches need this false teaching. But by the same token, we need to uh, know know what it is that it is that it's causing apparent evil on this plane, um, because uh, unfortunate things are happening. Uh, cataclysms, etc., and we see people acting in very, very animalistic uh, ways, killing, lying, stealing, cheating, climbing corporate ladders in a, in a very vicious manner, uh, stepping on other people as they go up 
Well, we're going to learn a lot about this uh, in this chapter. It's it's marvelous, and uh, it's a magnificent chapter which explains uh, the source of evil as the dark satellite. So, what is it? Well, the dark satellite. Um, On page 133 of this particular book, it says, by referring to the hermetic, hermetic constitution of man as elucidated in chapter 7 of the present work, let the student review the seven divisions of man. You see, he spoke about the seven chakras. So our body has seven chakras. And the earth does too. Bearing in mind the fact that the planet which man inhabits is also an individual possessing a sevenfold constitution. So the planet that we inhabit is an individual. And it possesses a sevenfold constitution corresponding in every respect to the constitution of man. Let him strictly apply the hermetic law for himself. As it is below, so it is above. As on the earth, so in the sky. So, as it is in the microcosm, the man, it must be in the earth. The earth is an individual, like we are. It goes on to say, then you will, then you will know exactly how to go to work to comprehend the subject. But as the ordinary student living wholly upon the external plane is not in position to verify his conception, he must be content himself for the present to accept the revelations which will be made upon the authority of those who know and have verified. <clears throat> in chapter 6, the Hermetic Constitution of Man occurs a description of the animal soul as it is called. Now, that magnetic sphere of our planet, which exactly corresponds to the animal soul of man, is what is occultly termed the dark satellite. So there you go. It's identified. The dark satellite that the occultists talk about, that has so much power over this earthly plane and is causing havoc uh, on, the, on the earthly plane, is uh, one of the chakras of the earth. <clears throat> Therefore, in order to comprehend this uh, dusky sphere, its nature and functions, it is absolutely necessary to understand the nature and functions of the animal soul of man, together with its relations to the other six divisions, and also to clearly grasp man's relation to the planet of which he forms, as it were, an atomic part towards an organic whole. There you go. We are atomic units of an organic whole. So as above, so below. So as we see, we have animal components of our soul. And we, we know that because we, we, we are capable of acting in very animalistic ways when we get angry and when we get uh, furious and jealous and envious, etc. So there's a lot of that animal nature that is still present with us, you see. And so is the earth, as above, so below. So people who act really, really animalistically are obviously acting in accord with that particular chakra and have not been able to detach themselves from it. So they've come under the direct influence of it, you see, magnetically connected to their uh, to their auras. They are connected to this animal chakra, which causes them to act compulsively, etc., in doing uh, wicked deeds. It will be then seen that this dark magnetic orb constitutes the grand centre of focus of the Earth's animal force. In other words, it is the realm of the undeveloped good. The realm of the undeveloped good. So these creatures, um, though this is a vast, vast satellite with many, many, many souls and spirits in it, 
they are the souls of the undeveloped good. And they haven't separated themselves from that animalistic nature. You see, in, in hermetic philosophy, we are, we are considered to be either intelligent human beasts or conscious human beings. And there's a world of difference. And in one lifetime, we are expected to, or at least we are given the potential to go from one and to the, to the other. You see, it's, it's within our capacity to transform and transmute the animal nature to become a conscious human being, a hero. Whereas, as the philosophers say, the herd, the herd is the, the masses of mankind who have not responded to their spiritual calling. You see, in the world, um, these two classes of people, the intelligent human beasts and the conscious human, um, human beings, are categorized as chosen, called, and captive in the Jewish system. Now, the captives, who would they be? Well, that'd be the people who are captive by this, this all, who act in animalistic ways. They're still under its influence. And as they develop and strive to reach out to do good, these ones are called. And the one who is doing the calling is the higher consciousness, you see. And these called ones, uh, they make efforts to detach themselves from, from the animal nature and to transmute their lead into gold. And once they have achieved this and endured Endurance is the key. Um, they are chosen. And that's what it means to be uh, chosen or, um, or called or captive. So, so we've discovered now, just in the few short paragraphs um, of this chapter, how Thomas Burgoyne, a great occultist, founder of the Hermetic um, um, Brothers of Luxor, uh, and they discovered many, many Egyptian uh, truths and the science, deep, deep sciences, these, um, these guys. Uh, Pappus was one of them. He was a Frenchman, an astrologer, and a trans transcendentalist. And uh, he was a, a good friend of Thomas H. Burgoyne. Um, these guys were able to identify the dark satellite. You know me. And um, <clears throat> they, um, it, he continues on to say here. Excuse me. Thank you. Let's try now. <laughs> He says, it will be seen that this dark magnetic orb constitutes the grand centre or focus of the Earth's animal force. In other words, it is the realm of the undeveloped good in nature whose terrible motto is embraced in the word self. Self. Yeah. So the motto of self, it says, the undeveloped good in nature has a terrible motto and it's embraced in the word self. Yeah, we've seen how destructive that motto can be. During the golden and silver periods of our Earth's evolution, this dark satellite was in the aphelion portion of its orbit and its influence was scarcely felt, or else its influence was seen and recognised only in its true relation of animal force and undeveloped good. 
But during the copper and iron ages, now take note, guys, so in the golden and the silver age, this dark satellite is not felt. The influence of it is um, very, very scarce. You see, it's, it's very, very... Um, Uh, very weak. Whereas during the Copper and Iron Ages, the orb in question gradually approached the Earth and its dark shadows became more and more bewildering and potent until the year 1881, when it passed its grand perihelion point. It is now slowly but surely receding. So take note that it reached the perihelion, the closest point to the Earth, and it reached that point of maximum influence, and now it is slowly receding, you see? So um, this is very important, because what we're witnessing in the world today is that the elites are not giving up their power. You see, they know that their days are numbered. They know that they've been exposed from every quarter, they know that um, there's a lot of infighting and squabbling, and they know that um, justice is coming after them, and it's not far away down the track. But they don't seem to want to give up. Oh, no, their game has been good. You know, the gravy train. They've been, um, They've been profiting from the stupidity and ignorance of mankind for a long, long time. And uh, the place where they have gotten their power is the dark satellite. Now they're losing the dark satellite. The dark satellite is abandoning them to their own evil devices. And um, they need to keep in touch with that dark satellite to continue their existence you see, as it recedes. But their powers are getting uh, less and less stronger because it is receding. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it is now slowly but surely receding, and although the clouds are not lifted from the mental horizon, and though the fact that the fearful conflict which occurred at the perihelion and the confusion and chaos seem more widespread and error more rampant than ever before in the world's history, yet it is past its darkest culminating point. As it is often darkest just before break of day, so even now the dawn of a brighter morn is at hand, when the faithful, resolute truth, truth speaker, truth seeker, shall be able to solve for himself this awful problem of good and evil, of light and shadow. Interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to I want to read some choice bits from here because um, it's quite encouraging to know that uh, things will be changing in the very near future. You see, they won't be um, we won't be uh, suffering because of the dark orb forever. Uh, <clears throat> in the first place, this orb possesses a complete organisation of its own and is governed by well-defined laws, the nature of which may be known only too well by patiently observing the merciless instincts of the lower animal nature as manifested in man, where the moral consciousness is absolutely wanting. Throughout the whole sphere are numerous races of spiritual beings, many of them possessing the highest forms of cunning and intelligence possible to the animal plane. Hit on me. Now, is that interesting? Throughout the whole sphere are numerous races of spiritual beings, many of them possessing, uh, possessing the lower uh, animal nature. In these beings who are neither elementals nor elementaries, who are the producers of the greatest portion of um, who are the producers of the greatest portion of the suffering and misery which afflicts humanity. 
there you go. So um, he's pointing to the fact <clears throat> that there are numerous spiritual races, numerous races of spiritual beings in this uh, dark satellite. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, with cunning and intelligence possible, the, uh, um, with the highest forms of cunning and intelligence possible to the human animal plane. Yeah, so there, there is where the Hermetist points out that there is separation of the two, um, the two creatures. The human, the intelligent human animal and the conscious human being. <clears throat> now, this is the important part because... Um, he explains how they actually interact with the, the Magi or let's say the, um, the sorcerers here on the earth and they would be the, um, the Christian corporations. Believe you me, there's, there's, there's no more, there is no more evil entities on the planet than the Christian churches. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is where we need to look for all the, for all the, the results on earth because they, they are totally connected and dominated by the dark satellite. This is why they want you to believe in, in Satan and the demons, <laughs> you see, because they want to divert your attention to the fact that they, in fact, are the Satan and the demons that they're accusing of all the wickedness. It's them because they're controlled by the dark satellite. And they've been trained in hiding this fact. They hide it by diverting your vision away to some invisible um, fiction that they've created. <clears throat> they are the active occult agents of that potent fraternity within the spiritual world which has its external expression and correspondence in the brotherhood known upon earth as the Black Magi. The Brotherhood of the Black Magi. That's who they control. And uh, those Black Magi are also in cahoots with the elites. They work together. And their business is controlled. And not letting go or relinquishing any aspect of that control. <clears throat> These two fraternities, viz, the spiritual rulers and potentialities of the dark satellite upon the astral plane and the schools of black magic upon the physical plane constitute the two halves of the evil, the planet's evil desire. All right, so I hope, I hope this has been, um, you know, able to be digested and absorbed as I read. I don't really like to read a lot because, because <clears throat> it's sometimes it's hard to follow, you know, long sentences and what have you. And it's, um, it's not so easy to um, to grasp, but basically what he's saying there is that uh, the dark satellite works and is connected directly to the dark um, the black magi, and that would be uh, primarily the um, cardinals at Rome. The cardinals at Rome are the apostolic senate. That's how Giovanni Pico della Mirandola identified them in the late 1400s when he went down to Rome with his 900 theses. And he went down to Rome and he uh, was going to challenge the Apostolic Senate. Take note of that word because we do have a Senate. There is a Senate. This is why you can have, a, you can have Senators in the US Congress, you can have Senators in our country, in Canada, because these senators are Roman officials, you see? And the highest ranking of these would be the cardinals. They run the city of um, the Vatican, which dictates to the world um, all of its, all of its uh, vomitous concoctions which come from the uh, dark satellite. And I want to share that with you, um, and that's probably the, um, 
the only other thing I want to share about the dark satellite for now, I think I, I think I'm going to have to do part two of this uh, next week because there's too much information here, and I realise that I'm, it's just it's too much to fully grasp this dark satellite. But we've seen from today's discussion that it is a magnetic animal chakra of this Earth. And since 1881, it has receded from the point of perihelion, which means closest to the centre. Perigee, in other words. And uh, we've learnt that uh, in the Golden Age and in the Silver Age, this uh, orb is not felt. But in the Copper and Iron Age, uh, it is, its influence is, um, is immediately felt. And you see, we see on the earthly plane how humans treat each other when this takes place. You see, it's the realm of undeveloped good. So what I'd like to do now is, um, and we'll do question and answers, of course, in the, um, the second hour, guys. So I see there's a few questions kicking around, uh, and I might even get back to those. Um, Enza says, is the dark satellite the moon? Um, no, it's not. The moon does have very dark aspects to it. All moons do. All moons are, um, you see, they are neutral in gender. Planets are feminine. In reality, they are feminine, even though Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter are, are, are masculine. But, but, but planets are feminine. Stars and suns are masculine. The fire is masculine. The earth of planets is, uh, is feminine, and moons are, are neutral. But um, the moon is not, is not the dark satellite. Uh, let's let's um, deal with that, shall we? Because I can see that that's that might be a little bit of a um, bit of a problem for some because many have been taught that, that it's the moon that is the dark satellite. Um, but um, let's see if I can find the spot where he talks about that because. Okay, he says, in the first place, certain misconceptions in regard to the dark orb need to be corrected. Many earnest students have thought it to be the lost orb of the Grecian mysteries, hence similar to the Egyptian conception of the spiritual fall. But there is, in fact, no connection between the two. The lost orb, in its cosmological aspect, will be found notice in the second part of this work. In its spiritual aspect, it applies to the fallen human soul, not the lost soul. Herein consists the difference between the two orbs, the lost and the dark. Okay? This is the dark orb, not the lost orb. Another misconception has regarded the moon, our Earth's visible satellite, as identified with the dark orb. Many theosophists, Theosophists assert in a very mysterious manner that the moon is not only the eighth sphere or the orb of death, of, um, death and dissolution, but that it is the dustbin of the universe. This conception is radically false as regards the moon. Although it approaches the realms of truth in some respects regarding the nature of the mysterious dark satellite. Yeah, so um, I hope that's answered that. The moon has got its dark features, but this is solely the uh, chakra of the earth, the dark satellite. Now, before I get off the subject of the dark satellite, and we'll have another go at it next week, I think, because um, this is really important information in our, in our repertoire of truth-telling. We don't want to be repeaters, you know, um, we don't want to be repeaters of erroneous indoctrination. We want to be truth tellers, truths, uh, truths that are verifiable. And um, so it's it's going to be handy, I think, to go over this a bit more because the the subject of good and evil is always on the lips of people when you're talking about truth, and they just don't understand it. You see, 
They don't understand that uh, good and evil is only happening in this dualistic plane. It, it doesn't exist in unity consciousness. It doesn't exist. It can't exist because that is love. And there's only love there. In unity consciousness, there is only love. And we come from there. And that is the source of who we are. We are sourced in that, in that love, that divine love. That is what we are. But in order to do things with these physical bodies and experience physical existence, we have to pop into the divided dualistic world where you have polarities. So I mean, if, if, everything, if, there, if everything was level here, if everything was good and there wasn't any chaos and love, love and friction, electricity and magnetism, it wouldn't work. You couldn't have motion because motion needs to move and it needs forces resisting and forces um, helping, like everything, you know. Um, everything has resistance, you see. Uh, for instance, the roof is being the roof above my head is being resisted by the walls if those walls were not resisting the weight of the roof i'd be squashed you see so nature in order for it to express itself in space it needs to move and it needs resistance and it needs to overcome that resistance and work with the resistance and that's what atoms are doing all the time um but uh The most, the most important thing that I can, that I can share, uh, I'm only going to share another snippet and then we'll go on to the subject of the mysteries of sex just briefly and from the same writer and, uh, because both of these subjects are very important and need a lot of um, thrashing out. They really do. They need a lot of uh, study and understanding. So let's spend... Uh, a bit of time on that too after the dark satellite and then we'll do the same again next week i feel because i'm it's just scratching the surface and it's inadequate what um, the the amount of time i'm giving it to it to today but um he talks about two classes of three classes of people um and this is this is this is what he said about our natural destiny of being immortal you see we we have that is our natural des destiny but um, this dark all can thwart us temporarily from this destiny and he says um, the great majority of those souls who are really human beings human beings you see the Hermetists talk about this a lot human beings as opposed to human beasts the intelligent ones who think they're conscious, but they're unconscious, intelligent human and human beasts. In other words, they're beasts in disguise as humans. And you can see that. You can you, there's there's millions of these people around. Just look around. I mean, the 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 scriptures poetically talk about these people as being on a on a on a broad and spacious road. Broad and spacious is the road leading to destruction, and narrow and cramped is the road leading to life. And few are on it. That destruction is only a temporary destruction, but it's necessary for the evolution of that particular entity for them to be able to learn and to incarnate and have various separate experiences so that they can grow their consciousness and return to immortal source. So they will inherit they will inherit immortality as the natural consequence of their humanity but there are there are exceptions which though few in number comparatively as previously suggested require special notice these exceptions may for the sake of convenience be divided into three distinct classes so this is the first class of human human that does not cut the grave and go to immortal existence okay 
And there's three types of people who don't get it. Uh, and the first and the most numerous class consists of imperfectly organised, sensitive, weak-minded, weak-natured individuals uh, with little or no mental bias who possess strong mediumistic magnetisms. Individuals of this class, though perfectly human to begin with, soon lose the actual control of the external organism and in consequence the body becomes the obedient instrument for any and every class of disembodied earth-bound spirits or what is still worse, it may become the slave of some, ver some vicious elementary. Second, the second class of those who fall victim to premeditated obsession, uh, sorry, the second class of those who fall victims to premeditated obsession and are by no means so numerous as the former. In this case, the organism is generally very fine so far as the magnetic temperament is concerned, that the soul is utterly wanting in spiritual volition or will. And you notice you look around people who you talk about spiritual science to them, you talk about themes of truth and consciousness and awakening, and they just look at you like, you're crazy. They have no spiritual volition or will. That's the second class. Now, those, these two classes, um, according to Thomas H. Burgoyne and the esoterists, these two classes um, have, have hope. But the third class virtually doesn't have much of a hope. Okay? And that's the, the, the sort of person who is chosen deliberately to practice evil because they know that that is all that they want to do. They are quite happy to be servants of the dark satellites. And this is how it works. This is the only other portion that I'd like to read, okay? Now, this is very, very important and probably the most important thing you could... Look, I think it's the most important thing you could read from this book in terms of good and evil and what is really, really going on out there rather than all this hocus-pocus about Satan and the devil and all of this other stuff. And obviously this is where the, uh, the ideas of the, the fourth dimensional uh, uh, entities come from, archons, reptilians, etc. Uh, this is where they get their, this is where they get their animal um, uh, spiritism from. They know about this fourth dimensional dark orb. And, and, and it is the dark orb where the reptilians inhabit. This is exactly it. This is the place, you see. Uh, so the third and last, so the third and last type of person that doesn't naturally get to be immortal. Um, also the least in number of these classes includes those who are born into the world under strangely conflicting conditions, possessing all the essential elements of manhood. They also possess a powerful current of the most potent and concentrated form of selfishness and pride. Selfishness and pride. They're killers. Selfishness and pride kill. That's their that is their um that's that is their role. <clears throat> In addition to this, the undesirable acquisition they express the highest form of intellectually combined intellectuality combined with a powerful will and mediumistic temperament these dominating conditions predispose them to the study of psychology and occultism hence they fall an easy prey to the members of the black magi take note guys because this is where a lot of freemasons and and all sorts of organizations have all been now under the control of the dark magi because because of their keenness to study the sciences but they haven't got they've got the selfishness and the pride too to go with it and the selfishness and the pride is what ultimately brings them down 
Uh, their selfishness combined with their un- un- unbounded ambition, and I can give you a few uh, names, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, George Bush, Barack Obama, uh, Giulio Berlusconi, etc. Creepy, vomitous, animalistic looking human beings who act like dogs and animals and vipers, because that's what they are <laughs> in human bodies. So it's no wonder that people are just so happy to kill and rape and pillage and destroy because they're animals. They're not conscious. They are intelligent, indoctrinated, educated human beasts. That's all they are and probably all they ever will be. Because it's their choice. Uh, you, You can choose to stay in the evil realm of duality forever if you like. Their selfishness combined with their unbounded ambition and desire for power precipitate them headlong into the most frightful practices. Yeah, Bohemian Grove, have you heard of Bohemian Grove? Have you heard of, um, you know, what they actually get up to in the the mansions of the elite and under the... uh, under the, uh, the Vatican, in the uh, catacombs and in all of those dark secret chambers under the Vatican. You only have to sniff around a little bit on YouTube and a little bit on the internet to find out what they're doing. It's human sacrifices, uh, blood drinking, etc., etc. These people are killers. They're killers because they've joined forces with the dark magi and the dark satellite. It's all animalistic spiritism. There's two kinds of spiritual spiritualism, people. <laughs> Be careful, because there's animalistic spiritualism and uh, there's spirituality from on high, from the cause, from where we come from, where we truly come from. And we're connected to that, and we are never, ever denied access to that source, ever. They're so... um, Surrounded by the infernal rites of their diabolical seducers... They become the helpless slaves of the very powers they sought to control. You see, a lot of these people that get hooked up with Freemasonry that's gone gone astray and serving the dark magi, at first it's all nice and cosy and they're learning the occult science and they're doing really well, but then they go deeper in and deeper in and they realise that uh, they're, they're actually working for very dark forces and they try and get out. Well, a lot of these people who try to leave end up getting killed. Or the other um, alternative is this. Henceward they are lost, as the hermetic law states, they are punished with death, and they know it, and consequently are compelled for their own safety to remain faithful to the order which entrapped them. And this is why these people are too scared to come out. Once Once they've been captivated by the dark satellite and the dark magi, They know that they can lose their lives if they go against it. They have to stay defending and helping and being foot soldiers of evil. That's what it means to lose your soul. And that's what um, Hermes says. Henceforward, they are lost. They are lost. So, you know, these politician types who are happy to sell our country to the banksters, you see what happened with Barack Obama in the Senate just a couple of days ago, that they voted in... um, you know, martial law, virtually, uh, police state. They can now come into your home, just grab you and take you away, and no one knows where you've gone. This is the Vatican, people. Make no mistake about it. It's the Vatican. It's the Inquisition. It's never, it never went away. It never will until the Vatican has gone away, until the world occupies the Vatican and grabs those little bastard, putrid, vomitous cardinals out of there and prosecutes them, and deals justice to them. Justice, how they've dealt to the rest of humanity for the last 2,000 years. Killing, burning, destroying, pillaging, land grabbing, murdering. And all because they have chosen to be animalistic and not human beings. So I'm glad, guys, that uh, you've chosen the, the right path. The right path is knowledge and science. Knowledge and science. For their single, 
for their own single lives, they would sacrifice the balance of God's creation, if such a thing were possible, simply because death to them is death in reality. You see, the true philosopher does not fear death. The true, um, the true hermetic scientist does not fear death because there's no such thing. But these people, controlled by the dark magi, they fear death. They fear death because they know that death for them is death. It really is death. All right, so look, um, I'll leave it at that, but I thought that that was the most crucial part of the whole subject of the dark satellite, guys. And that is that um, how we can see that we need to we need to really understand that the elites are also being controlled by this dark satellite. That they also have a very, very, very vicious life to live because they are afraid for their lives to, to get out of those organisations because they know they can get whacked. And they do. I mean, even Rockefellers and Rothschilds get whacked for leaving the clan, for spilling the beans and for telling, you know, secretive information that they don't want to get out there. So absolutely, um, we need to understand this and uh, be careful that we do not come under the control of these forces. Uh, and look, perhaps next week we can go a little bit more into this and uh, delve into the, um, the finer details of all of this um, information. But for now, I hope that suffices. Uh, we'll have a break. And after that, I'd like to talk about the mysteries of sex for about 10 or 20 minutes, and then we'll do some question and answers. So uh, thanks, Dave. I suppose we can just um, go to a break now, and I'll be back in, say, uh, five to 10 minutes. Thank you. Dealing with the subject of the mysteries of sex, there's a chapter in the, um, in the book, The Light of Egypt, which is, I'm going to recommend. Um, and it's uh, chapter 4 on page 37. And um, in here he deals with the, the fact that um, most of mankind is only aware of the, the physical attributes of sex and um, on the physical plane, but have no idea of how important it is for transmuting the uh, lower nature, the animal nature, and um, using sex to etherealize the human condition. Uh, now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this today because I've gone way over time and uh, we won't have any time for question and answer. Uh, but um, he mentions there that the Kabbalistical initiates of the ages that are gone formulated the same biune spirit as love and wisdom. Love is feminine, ma wisdom is masculine in occultism. Love as the negative or feminine ray is content and ever seeks to unfold, uh, to, sorry, to enfold. Wisdom as the positive masculine ray is restless and always in pursuit. The feminine forces are ever striding to encircle the atom and the masculine forces to propel it in a straight line. So you see, masculinity wants to go in a straight line atomically, but the feminine force is always wanting to envelop the atom and embrace it and enfold it, you see. So here he's explaining the metaphysical aspect of the sexuality of the universe. Everything is sex. Everything in the universe is expressing itself sexually. So he goes on to explain here in this chapter that celibacy initially is very, very harmful. Whereas once the initiate has been able to use the sexual en energy in a proper, proper way, uh, celib celibacy is very, very appropriate. Uh, but it takes... It takes a lot of work, you see. It takes a, a lot of working out. Um, <clears throat> but this is how he explains this, and it's uh, quite interesting. 
because there's a lot of misunderstanding about celibacy and it does so much harm. The seminal fluids, he says, are the most ethereal of all physical secretions. They contain the very quintessence of human nature. The sexual organism exists as a factor in procreation. Therefore, the organs have their proper functions and use, or they would not be present. To suddenly and completely suppress their natural functions will do a great deal of physical and spiritual harm because the reaction will create violent discord with the ethereal constitution. In fact, the complete suppression is almost as bad as the excessive use or sensual indulgence. It is only one of the two extremes, nothing more. When the sexual organism is involved above the physical plane of its manifestation, the seminal fluids are absorbed by the magnetic constitution and the more 